Hello, my name is Talib Küçükcan and I welcome you on behalf of TRT World Forum to Digital Debates. Today we are going to talk about the 15th of July coup attempt in Turkey and how it has failed and uh, security implications of that failed coup attempt. Today we have uh, a very important guest, um, Ambassador Ceren Yazgan. She is Ambassador of Turkey to the uh, to Tbilisi at the moment. She has a long career in diplomacy. I will just briefly introduce her to our audience, then we will move on to our discussion. Uh, Ambassador Yazgan is uh, uh, at the uh, Foreign Office of Turkey for a long time. Previously, she served as the Deputy Director for Security Affairs at the Turkish Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, and she joined Foreign Affairs in 1993. She served at the Turkish Embassy in Muscat, Kiev and Moscow, as well as at the Turkish permanent mission to the OSCE. She has worked at the bilateral political desks, as well as at the Directorate of Security and Intelligence. Therefore, we host her today because she has a lot of experience in security and intelligence affairs. Ambassador Yazgan, I would like to welcome you to our program. Thank you very much for joining us. Before we move on to the security implications of this coup attempt uh, on the 15th of July in 2016, can you please refresh our memories what has happened on that night? That was um, the horrible night and it is um, sometimes traumatic to remember to all of us who had lived through that. Uh, I was in the office, so I was talking to my uh, colleagues, my friends in the, uh, the directors of police who were in the heart in Ankara. And then I was talking to people in Istanbul, trying to understand. Our now deputy minister, uh, Mr. Yoselim Karan, uh, called me on the phone and said, I was in the office, he said, do you know what's happening? Because they were not in Ankara at that stage. You know what's happening in Istanbul is they, they say that it's a coup attempt. And I said, oh, come on. Coup attempt in 2016, and and I was thinking he was absolutely wrong. And then in a couple of hours, when I found out what was going on, uh, it was first a disbelief of that uh, this uh, Feto had really attempted to do a coup attempt, killing people in the middle of Ankara by tanks. And, and the more information that came, the more we knew how crazy that they were to attempt this coup. Uh, but of course, it's not it's beyond crazy. And, and then the events unfolded that night um, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We were hearing the bombing. We were listening, how many tours can the F-16s do? Because we were trying to understand, who are they? And when they, they, they bombed the Ankara police directorate, when we heard uh, that there were people who were killed there, our, our policemen, it was um, um, a sense of betrayal, uh, a sense of uh, surreal, uh, Feeling. And so, yes, it was very traumatic, but it was also a big anger of the extent of this betrayal. Because we knew who Feta was. We knew how deeply that they were trying to uh, capture the state, what's called the state capture. We were struggling against it for the past two years of 2014. I remember that we all started uh, in the ministries, in the state structure, to find out what sort of uh, monster that we are uh, dealing with. And it's like the monster which is under the bed. It's like there, you know it is, but people are telling it's not there, and it was there. So um, that night, the monster came out of the bed. That's the right. Uh, I just would like to add, add a few things to inform our audience. Uh, more than 251, uh, more than 250 people lost their lives in defense of democracy in Turkey, and also thousands of people were were wounded. Uh, that was a traumatic uh, issue, but I think it was also victorious uh, defense of the Turkish democracy at that night. 
So this is something I think that the, the whole world should, uh, uh, should see. Uh, and as far as we know, uh, when we looked at the uh, testimonies of the uh, people who were involved in the coup attempt and also the court cases, we see that the members of the FETO, member of the Fethullah Gulenist terrorist organization, infiltrated into different organizations, including foreign ministry, of course, to the military and also to the police force and some other public institutions. To what extent they pose a threat to Turkey's security from that perspective, given the degree of uh, their infiltration into public institutions? I think once you read the, the court cases and the investigations, it's very apparent. But let me just put it in very clear terms. If a state uh, servant, a civil servant, has allegiance to any group that is beyond the, the state, the flag, and the values that we swear to protect, uh, the democracy one, and democracy not only in terms of voting, but it's also about being uh, transparent, being um, accountable, using the authority that is given to you uh, within your limits of the job description, uh, responsible for it. But then uh, we found out that the military generals in in army were feeling themselves accountable, not to their commanders, but to, say, a teacher or a what we call a simple civil servant in somewhere else. It was completely a different cult organization, uh, which organized itself in cells, which organized itself in secrecy. And, and, and remember, there was a court case, a judge uh, decided in Turkey in written form that Fethullah Gülen himself is the messiah. We're talking about uh, this extent of radicalization. And the, the, the danger of it is great. It's immense. I'm not saying was. I'm saying is. It is a continuing struggle. It is a continuing effort. Uh, just in the past month, there had been a very important investigation, which we all read from the press, um, and that there are still people hiding this, members of this organization. Some of them maybe think that they will not be found out, but they will be, and there will be more evidence coming up. And some of them try to come back to the service, of the state service. Um, it is very painful because these people are, did not come from the space. Uh, they have come from the same uh, neighborhoods. We know these people. So right, it is Ambassador very Yazgan, that brings, yeah, yeah. that brings us to the issue of Turkey's security priorities, because as you have just said, uh, these people had allegiance for the to not the Turkish state, but, you know, some other uh, states or some other organizations. Here, I would like to ask, how have Turkey's security priorities changed in the wake of failed coup attempt? To what extent uh, Turkey has changed its security priorities, both inside and outside? Um, Professor, I mean, uh, our priorities, we don't have the luxury to change our priorities, I think, because we are living in a very uh, volatile region where a couple of terrorist groups, PKK, YPG, Daesh, uh, Al-Qaeda, numerous of them, left revolutionaries, they are ample amount around us and beyond our borders. So we don't have the luxury of prioritization, but FETER, is not a, just a simple terrorist group. It is a terrorist organization and more. And it has come in uh, from the within of the state. It has captured parts of the state and used it against the people and the other part of the state. And it is still trying to do that. And now there is a diaspora of FETA abroad. They are broadcasting through Twitter, they have uh, funds, NGOs, and they are trying to tarnish the reputation of Turkey. They are trying to use uh, everything, and they are collaborating with all known anti-Turkish anti lobbies. And, and, and to be frank, 
uh, while our, I don't think our priorities have changed, and I'm being the ambassador uh, in, in a foreign capital in Tbilisi, I am not the person to talk about maybe the general uh, priorities, but um, where I am, uh, I cannot say uh, a PKK terrorism uh, or a FETO terrorism is less or more important. What I can say is wherever they are present, FETO, wherever they are present, they are in different forms, in business, making money and spending that money for their own purposes. And they are trying to interrupt and uh, meddle with the Turkish relations to that country. So, and for instance, now we see a lot, the lobbies. And, and secondly, it's about still recruiting. They are still recruiting. And who are they recruiting? They are first trying to get their next generations to believe or the, the people that they have been in touch with traditionally to believe that they are harmless still. They um, portray themselves as democracy uh, defenders. They are not. And so we have maybe not the priorities in terms of targets, but we have to prioritize sometimes uh, regarding where the threat comes from in, in the sense that sometimes it's not with guns that now FETA is targeting Turkey, but it is trying to target us individually. In Twitter, they target diplomats. In Twitter, yeah, journalists. So it's a... It's right. a Ambassador Yazgan. As you have said, uh, this is a different organization. This is not a conventional, this is not something that we are used in terms of uh, uh, radical groups or uh, terrorist groups. PKK is something different, IRA is something different. I mean, these are all well known. As you have described, this organization seems to have gone beyond that. I mean, they have used different techniques, methodologies, uh, and they have used education, they have used you know, religion in, in many areas. And now, uh, as the, uh, I think, uh, court cases uh, come to conclusions, we see many reports that they were uh, infiltrated, they, they infiltrated into many institutions. And how Turkey, uh, what kind of measures Tur Turkey uh, has taken in order to prevent, uh, let's say, reintegration of these people into this machinery? What sort of measures do you have taken, both in your ministry and in other critical institutions like the military, the police, intelligence in Turkey, as well as, of course, the judiciary, because they were very influential in the judiciary. More than 4,000 of them, I think, were kicked out of the uh, Minister of Justice. Um, to be frank, uh, from the beginning, um, there was, uh, uh, in just in judiciary, for instance, uh, when I was working uh, responsible for the subject, one of the questions which we faced, how did you find out this 4,000 plus people in the judiciary and overnight decided? It was because there was an investigation for a, at least two years. There was an investigation within the Ministry of Justice to find out what sort of uh, structure they have established. And and thanks to that, uh, in the wake of 2016, we were able to, the, the court attempt, uh, the, the Ministry of Justice was able to uh, clean up very quickly. Uh, obviously, the military took some time, and it is still taking time, because that is the place where they had more secretive uh, structures. And it is, we're talking about an intelligence organization-style structure here. The police also, thanks to the efforts uh, of the police in 2014, there was a start, and and actually because of that, the coup attempts uh, failed. Uh, the police was already cleansed, and it's not a coincidence that all that federal police guys went to the intelligence police intelligence department to capture it that night. Uh, so. In uh, foreign ministry, uh, there had been a couple of cases and, and continued, and, but there was a general um, criteria, and the criteria is not only a bylaw, uh, it's not only being uh, a teacher, it's not only about Bank Asia, it's a collection of many of these criteria, and and that is actually uh, in order to not to make mistakes, uh, there has been a co commission established where. Many people, now there are two things which are uh, important to underline. There are criminal cases regarding the crimes committed against the national security, against people, against the state, and so on. But also, there are 
those who may not have been found out to be a, a, a crime, a committing a crime, but there is a specific evidence that shows intelligence that shows that this person is connected to that organization. So there's a collective identity, a collective uh, belonging to a group which has undermined state authority. And that uh, was the reason why many people were actually told to leave the state service. And, and that was a very um, uh, necessary measure because in the state, in the government service, if we cannot trust the people we work with, if we cannot trust that they will not, uh, they will use that authority, the information that they are privy to, for the benefit and within the law, then we cannot work. We cannot work that mechanism. And ag exactly because we have seen in 2015-16 in counterterrorism operations uh, in in judiciary there were very uh, interesting decisions which we told them why it was not possible uh, to do this. And and now we found out after all that that they have sabotaged the work of the state mm -hmm. in 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 very. Uh, important issues in counterterrorism included, and they have leaked information to other governments. Now, look, there is in Germany now this week, uh, but it's been a couple of years that has been going on. They found a neo-Nazi cell in uh, mm -hmm. in a very important place of their uh, security forces, and they are investigating and they are kicking them out of the service. This is what we did. Exactly what right. We did. So, I think this um, is uh, this is a critical point. Please, please finish what you would like to say, and we can move on to a different subject. Sure. What I want to say is the commission still works. Hundreds and thousands of people there, and the commission uh, has concluded some could go back and some could not. And it will be a, a process. But we have also seen some attempts, even during the COVID crisis, uh, that certain people who were... Uh, dismissed from the state service, they wanted to say that, oh, we're doctors, we want to go back to the service and, and because they're useful. And then they didn't even still admit that they are a member of this. They were a member because I do believe that it is very hard to disengage, to de-radicalize. Now, disengagement and de-radicalization from a cult and an organization as such, which has established formats of thinking and behavior for that many years uh, from the childhood and on and and that people are believing that they're going to go to heaven uh, if that men living in Pennsylvania uh, prays for them so uh, this is uh, fully uh, um, I'm talking about fully radicalized cult radicalization as well and also a group ambassador Right, Ambassador, you are talking about a, as I said, I mean, very unconventional and uh, fairly sophisticated organization, which have links, uh, you know, uh, around the world. Uh, of course, the 15th of July was a trauma in Turkey, but it was, as I said, it was also a defense of democracy. But, uh, you know, you were engaged in talking to people outside Turkey as a diplomat and trying to maybe uh, explain what happened in Turkey, because Turkey was also accused of uh, human rights violations because of, uh, you know, um, kicking out many people from the uh, offices, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I wonder to what extent the international community understood what happened in Turkey. Do you think um, they have really understood the threat that Turkish democracy has faced, the challenges that Turkey have uh, faced at the time? Uh, some of them did. Some of them uh, didn't want to acknowledge that they understood. Uh, but some of them truly did. They, But they were also suspicious like because they had the trust in the Turkish uh, democracy and the state. And they said to us, they asked us, they said, how could you not know? They, To be frank, it was also hard for some Turkish citizens, let alone the foreigners, to grasp what had happened. And yes, there were times that uh, these people uh, were perceived as peaceful um, charity education organizations with 
um, some, um, I, I don't like that word, but I will use it in quotation, moderate Islamism. That's what they used. And there are reports, Rand report in 2008, if you look, uh, there are also descriptions uh, of that role that they were designed for. And uh, so it was an organization which came out in 40 years. It evolved. It, it became maybe what it was now. But there was that danger of secret uh, working. So the foreigners uh, also being uh, less interested and sometimes a bit ignorant about um, the Islam, the what we call the Jamaat, Tariqats, and all that, these are all concepts which are very foreign to people. And Turkey is a very specific country with its, uh, we are not that transparent uh, from an eye. So we have to describe, we have to under, tell them what happened. Now, that's why the term state capture is very important. The term, and also they used the, our history of coups. We had, unfortunately, in our democracy, real coups, coup d'etat, where military, had uh, deep coups and and we lost uh, prime minister, uh, foreign minister. They were they were executed. So there is a, a history of Turkey, Turkish democracy, and they used that image. Like uh, and uh, and I must say that they have for a long time paved the way of that anti-Turkey, anti-Turkish discourse in the media prior to the coup as well. The human rights uh, issue, I think any country which faced the threat that Turkey had faced from 2012 to 2016 and onwards, and today still we're facing a couple of terrorist threats uh, and the regional conflict, any country uh, which is committed to the Council of Europe values, and we are, and Turkey is, um, could not have done less. Uh, of course, there are cases which have to be looked into individually, and I think which are being looked into individually. Uh, but on the other hand, there is also an amazing uh, attempt, and still continues, I see in the media, in the social media, uh, and, and uh, in particularly Western media, uh, subsidized by other foreign countries. So it's not only the FETA which is working uh, their discourse, but they also receive backing from other countries. Then how does that play into Turkey's relations with the world outside? I mean, when you look at FETA, they are present in some other countries, and the leader of FETA, Fethullah Gulen, lives in the United States of America, and some of those FETA members took refuge or, you know, are seeking for asylum in European countries. How does that influence Turkey's foreign relations with the countries that I uh, referred to? Well, I, I, as an ambassador uh, in Tbilisi, I have really appreciated last year when the four political parties in our parliament called for need of cooperation with Turkey for the extradition of Fethullah Gulen and other federal members from wherever they are, because they have to be brought to justice. They are responsible not only for the lives that we have lost on the 15th of July, but for all the lives that they have stolen, these young people, that there has been this radicalized. And these are still the people of Turkey. And they have to be held accountable in front of justice for the lives that they have destroyed, in many terms, the victims, as well. And um, so um, that is an effort which I think will continue in our relations. Uh, however, what FETO wants is to alienate, to isolate us in our relations with any bilateral relations. And they would like to, uh, behind the curtains, they're never uh, brave enough to come out. And they still do slander. Uh, they used half truths. They manipulate them. Propaganda, definitely. What they call the the fake news. They're masters of that, and they uh, try to go with the influence of their past relations. The people who they have paid, for instance, salaries. Who they helped in their careers. Who they helped in their research. They use extensively this 
uh, Washington-style lobby. And, and I think in Europe, uh, in different countries, there are different tactics, which are not for me to speak today. Uh, but definitely we can see where they are in Western Europe. They are trying to keep that network, which is uh, around 160 countries. Uh, the schools, the business, it is still a network and it is there. And I've just watched a wonderful uh, TRT World uh, Network, the, the, the documentary. It's very obvious. We're talking about hundreds of millions of U.S. tax payers' money, which is going into their system. And I'm sure there is a way that they sustain their existence in other places. Like, uh, you have worked in uh, a think tank, uh, an academician. You know how it is and how hard it is to fund a think tank. How many think tanks they have? When in the Europe, when you say they live in Brussels, they live in Stockholm, they live in Germany, it is expensive. And uh, so, who funds them? How do they get funds? That is well, one question it. that I think should be really, really uh, asked very frequently. It's not basically to tell uh, the other countries that uh, it's threatening us only, uh, it's also they're also in their pockets. Well, I think uh, it seems that, you know, the presence of uh, FATA members and their organizations in different countries uh, will be a problematic issue for Turkey for some time to come. At least, you know, they will try to poison the relations between Turkey and the countries where they are established. Uh, this is one case. But now I'd like to move on to post-Soviet space, where I think you are familiar with and you have been following and observing for, for many years. Um, what was the extent of FATO influence in the post-Soviet space before the coup? And what is their influence at the moment, as you can see? Well, first, um, uh, with uh, due respect, I will rephrase the post-Soviet space because it's gone. Uh, I think uh, we have to find a new, uh, a new terminology to describe. But uh, what I could say is, uh, today what is... Um, uh, in the post-Cold War, when the transition, uh, the democracies in transition, e economic transition was happening, uh, FETO, then called the Hizmet Movement, was one of the instruments to uh, come open schools, get business, and they were teaching Turkish, they were teaching English. And it was about bridging that part newly independent states this was state building and nation building with some Turkic mother tongue speakers and some geographic affinity. So this was a, basically a tool of bridging that was used. It was not, by the way, really a Turkish government uh, decisions all the time. Their ties with the different partners then started, international ties. I think we all know about and um, this existence, which came in 1990s in the very dire straits uh, to the, uh, these countries, have been an example, actually, uh, on the basis of which they have built for Africa, for Southeast Asia as well. So, for instance, Georgia, Kyrgyzstan, these were the first stops, the first schools opened here. And... Some of them actually opened before they had enlarged their education network in Turkey. In Ukraine, the same way. They tried to uh, recruit the families, not only the students, into their, um, what I call a trade-off influence. They were trying to get, and because of the state structures being uh, not completely strong, in these countries, they were able to uh, work through the nepotism, which was an heritage from the Soviet uh, party system. So they have, instead of helping that transition to a real transparent market economy, they helped, uh, they actually sort of manipulated through the corruption. This was noticed by many of their competitors. I mean, can you imagine that they 
get to have uh, a piece of land uh, which the other uh, national, like the Georgian national, cannot get that piece of land, but they could. How? So uh, all these nepotism helped them to grow. And this is uh, the scholarships. They gave scholarships. And those scholarships helped uh, these families, influential families sometimes, uh, to get an access to decision making. So did, this is did the they way get they... Some of the, right. Did they get some of the students to Turkey? I mean, did they recruit students from Georgia to Turkey I mean, this is, to uh, the way... provide education? Of course they provided education, but they are uh, and have always been very clever in the sense they would go for, uh, like they would never allow a Christian uh, child to convert to Islam because they knew that that would cause reactions to them. But instead, they would go and work on uh, the communities which uh, after the, uh, the Soviet regime have uh, rejuvenated uh, their Islamic uh, identity and they will target them. So yes, there are many in this geography who uh, have been educated in their, not only schools, but also in their houses. And that houses are the problematic part. And in the schools, people usually told me, oh, they're not teaching anything about religion. They're not giving any religious education. I, I know. Actually, in their schools in Turkey, they wouldn't be talking about any of the Gulen's teaching or whatever. They would do it in the houses. This is the, 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 the schools serve them in multiple purposes. And here in this geography, yes, they did a lot through the schools, with the houses, they always tried to find the, the brilliant, the most clever, but also most in need. So can I, can I ask you, can I ask, it was in Turkey. Right. Can I ask you a question regarding Georgia? What sort of institutions did they establish in Georgia in addition to schools? Because education is something that they are well known, but what additional institutions they have set up to recruit people or to influence public opinion? Um, in the past, they had a business association. Uh, the, the schools are not only schools, that it's actually a corporate scheme. Uh, there's a university. And, and this corporate company has ties uh, to an EU member state. So, um, the companies are still here. They had been collecting money, and they always had this sister, like like Mutevelihet, which is like the board of directors, which was coming from one city. The Georgian uh, city, uh, what we call, was Denizli. So you could find a lot of people. They still have investments here. They are still building. This was a, a country uh, when we started this struggle against uh, FETA. This was a country where they have used the way out because of the easy travel border schemes. And uh, the, uh, particularly what they try to do um, now, and they always did that, they try to align themselves with the Western human rights organizations, NGOs, uh, and they try to be a part of that um, opposition movement, uh, which may legitimately uh, look for a political uh, struggle in their own country. But they actually are like the parasites. They try to okay. increase their uh, nuisance value or pressure factor, but they definitely try to live uh, in that plethora. So, uh, in, in Georgia, they had links with many uh, people, but then uh, during those times, to be frank, uh, they were also in Turkey and the Turkish governments were backing them. 
So it wasn't that they were right. in in 1990s until uh, I would say in and until 2014 they were quite uh, liberal and they had the support of the government. The first school, Demiral, is called Demiral. The people here so the Demiral school, which has been closed down, thanks to that, uh, uh, was an example. A school which taught English, a good curriculum, had nice facilities. The question was that they use that school to have access to the Georgian uh, ruling elite. And now today, I think this is, they uh, of course lost. They lost that privilege right. because in Georgia, there are very good schools now. Uh, which are much, much better than any schools that they could manage. And they're private schools, they're public schools. Georgia has been doing a quite successful education reform. And so they are losing their influence. And because... Okay, I think they, they... Ambassador Yazgan, we are coming to the end of our discussion. Yes, sure. there's a lot of things to talk about, but you know they have used or misused educational institutions everywhere like in uh, in the country that uh, where you are in Georgia. But my last question will be about Georgia again. I mean, to what extent Turkey and Georgia cooperated in dealing with this issue, in bringing people to justice to Turkey, uh, as far as uh, FETA is organized? Because, you know, since you've been there, I think you have made some efforts and it seems that uh, there are things coming to fruition. Um, I mean, not only because of me, uh, it's... Uh my predecessor as well, our government uh, has been working on that, Georgian government as well. Of course, we do everything uh, according to the legal setting. Both Georgia and Turkey are members uh, to the Council of Europe, and we have the legal observations, and we do. We have uh, asked for extradition of a couple of them uh, who were residing here. For instance, one was not extradited because he has a Georgian citizenship, and the other one, I think, left the country. Uh, so there what we are basically doing with the Georgian government is we are giving them the evidences and the, the circumstantial evidence as well as uh, the, the factual evidences to, to, to show and, and, and to help the Georgian legal structures to see what they should be looking for. Because nobody knows, to be frank, this organization better than we do. Uh, we were the victims of that organization for a long time. And many countries don't even realize now that they are the victims. They will. They will. It's like the COVID. Uh, they will attack their textures and immunity mm -hmm. systems because that's what we worry. Georgia is our strategic partner, is our good neighbor, and it is our duty. Uh, and we will be keeping uh, this work. It is a long way, but I think it is a sure way. And we will be uh, making sure that FETA will neither have the capacity to hurt us again from Georgia, nor hurt Georgia uh, and the Georgian government. Uh, Ambassador Yazgan, what would be your call to the international community to fight organizations like FETO? In one minute, please. Um, I would say um, don't take your uh, democracy for granted. Don't take, don't take uh, these people for their face value. And uh, we, as the people of Turkey, the ambassadors of Turkey, the government of Turkey, the academics of Turkey, uh, we are much reliable than them. They have deceived the Turkish governments. They have betrayed their own people, their own democracy. And once you pull arms against civilians, and once you can try to justify that. I think um, when they try to defend those values, the rights um, that is obviously a fake face. So uh, in in a in, in I'm trying to be very polite here, and and I'm saying that don't be naive uh, because we pay the price. And we don't want uh, to pay that price ever again. And we will not let anyone to uh, have us on that point again. I can assure you that the whole Turkish you. people 
will be fighting against it. Your Excellency Fatma Ceren Yazgan, Ambassador of the Republic of Turkey to Tbilisi. Thank you very much for joining us. It was Thank a great pleasure to host you me. at the TRT World Forum Digital Debate. Thank you. It's an honor. Thank uh, you I very hope much. we will, uh, yeah, we will continue our debate on the 15th of July coup attempt in Turkey. Uh, see you tomorrow. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you.